Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Facebook Live. I'm Jeff Palmer. I'm CEO and founder of Clean Machine. And uh, four times a year, uh, we give back to a uh, vegan and plant-based nonprofit. And uh, really blessed to have a wonderful nonprofit that we're supporting for all month of August. So every time you purchase one of our products, 10% of that purchase, uh, when you purchase online on our website, will go for the month of for the entire month of August, will go to this wonderful uh, nonprofit, vegan nonprofit, Hogs and Kisses Farm Sanctuary. Um, they're a 501c3 uh, nonprofit, and I am fortunate to have two of the uh, board members, uh, founding members of the micro farm. So first let's start right there because I know that's kind of unique. Explain the concept of a micro farm and why that's important in this day and age um, as opposed to just the, the typical sanctuary. Sure, yeah. Thanks for having us. Um, and uh, you want me to take this one, Ella? Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, so Ella and I have been friends for a very long time. Actually, everyone, she is the, the main reason I ended up going vegan a little over a decade ago. And so when I asked her to become a part of the board, it was like coming full circle. <laughs> so, um, yes, so a farm sanctuary, as everybody knows in their mind, is kind of this hundreds of acres and animals are then rescued and usually farm animals, right, are rescued from um, factory farming and uh, started with Gene Bauer in the 80s. And then it's been slowly taking hold and more and more sanctuaries growing. Well, if it's the case, though, that uh, someone has a lot of that funding to do that level and that scale of sanctuary, um, great, right? And, and many times people come into a farm and then take it over in its current state. Uh, however, there are so many more now vegans coming about uh, or people are interested in plant-based eating and maybe they love animals too and they want to, to do their part. And so um, a group actually uh, started um, Micro Sanctuary Resource Center, and you can find that at microsanctuary.org, uh, started by the Van Cleeks. Uh, they kind of coined that term because if you give sanctuary really to any animal, you're, you're providing that same level of care, comfort, and you're also in that way making that statement about farm animals. Um, and so they really wanted it to be something that was a little more tangible and doable for, for people, uh, because maybe you are really um, into rabbits or affinity for chicken, and, and then you have a small amount of land, well, great, you could go ahead and rescue some, save them, and provide them an amazing life and home on maybe just one acre of land. Uh, so you could still partake in, in the movement forward in making sure these animals are cared for, but now it's on that kind of micro level. Uh, so it is, it does mean like say in numbers, micro, uh, but certainly really worked for myself and Ella and our other board member, James, because none of us had farm experience whatsoever, right? Ella and I are coming from Miami, have now gone country, right? So we wanted to make sure we were responsible and did things right. So we love this idea of micro because we can take our time really learn the species that we wanted to help and take our time with it because we're constantly asked to take in animals and we just can only do what we can do uh, so doing it in a micro farm setting or way or approach is helpful for that for those who maybe don't have farm experience as well so uh, it kind of checked the box in a lot of ways <laughs> for for us and i think i think that's really important <laughs> when a lot more people are looking to, uh, for ways that they can contribute, but uh, feel like, oh, that may be biting off too much to chew at once, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So how, how many animals do you have uh, currently? <laughs> sure. So we currently have five and literally we opened our barn doors this May. Okay. Um, and we're sitting here. Actually, we've got a couple here. Um, Dolly is our polka dotted pig and the all black pig there is Grace. Uh, they are sisters. And we have a third pig 
And Ella, do you want to pan over? She's in the um, mud wallow over there, <laughs> if you can see her rolling around. Um, and her name is Rubia, because we refer, refer to her as the blonde one. So that's blondie in Spanish. Um, so we have three pigs, and then we also rescued two bunnies. Um, is it okay if I share their backstory as well? Jeff? Sure, I'd love that. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So these um, three piggies uh, were actually on a production farm in New York. Um, however, the farmers were kind of like backyard farmers, so to speak, and they had a small um, scale production. The wife ended up falling in love with the pigs, learned a lot about them, and said she just couldn't send them to slaughter anymore. And so what she decided was, you know what? We're gonna get out of farming pigs. And so she ended up calling a bunch of sanctuaries. Um, and there was one sanctuary in particular, Woodstock actually in the, uh, New York that helped to rehome these last 11 pigs. And so three of them came to us and we said, sure, we'd be happy to take them. Uh, they are four years old and, and um, they their breeds are very large farm pigs. So they are Yorkshire Tamworth uh, and large black breeds. So that's their story. And then, oh, actually, Rubio wants to come and say hello. She's now coming. There she is. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> yes, that is her version of a mud mask. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, and then our bunnies uh, here locally in Virginia, people still raise bunnies to eat as meat. And so there was again a backyard farm and um, bunnies breed very rapidly. And so I believe that the farm had financial issues and could not sustain. They were seized and closed down. Rescue groups went in to then take over the animals. There were sheep, goats, pigs, and then a lot of bunnies. So our two bunnies ended up going around to about three other foot homes before they came to our forever home. Um, and so they are uh, thriving as well. There are two sisters, uh, Canel and Noisette. That's awesome. And so <clears throat> bringing in these animals from a farm area, there's some adjustment uh, period for them too, I can imagine. Um, how long does it take them to get used to their new home and to get used to you and build that relationship? And talk about how that relationship changes from probably a lot of fear in the very beginning to, to uh, really opening up and finding themselves at home and at peace and comfortable with, with not only their new surroundings, but with the new relationships with humans. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it was yeah. it was an interesting story going up to uh, pick these ladies up. Uh, we had this vision that we can laugh about right now because we had this vision that we were going to go up to this farm and we were going to go out into the pasture and we were going to sit down and, and get to know and get to know each other, the pigs and us. And then they would hop on the trailer and we just <laughs> bring them on home to their new beautiful home. Well did not happen like that. Um, we got there and they were contained already in a small barn. They had never been off that property, never been in a trailer. Uh, and before we got there, they had their ears tagged. So they were already kind of like in a, in a place where they were feeling anxiety just in the last few days. Um, so getting them on the trailer was quite a feat, was mm -hmm. it not? It was, because, I mean, you can't make a 700-pound pig do anything they don't want to do, you know? <laughs> well, that's the other thing. We, we didn't realize, <laughs> another part of our inexperience, we didn't know how big these girls were. Yes. We were kind of expecting uh, probably half the size they were. Mm -hmm. So when we got there, we were like, oh, what is wow, that? We were yeah. a bear is that a bear in there? In there? <laughs> And they were our piggies. <laughs> so so it, it took it took a lot of uh, work and patience and mm -hmm. trying different things, but eventually we did get them um, onto the trailer. It was a very emotional ride home. Mm -hmm. um, we first had to stop in in Pennsylvania to have them spayed. You want to talk about why? Yeah, sure. So Pennsylvania has an amazing, amazing uh, vet center for farm animals. It's called the New Bolton Center. And because we were going up to New York and Pennsylvania on the way to Virginia, because we're in Virginia, uh, it was kind of a halfway point. We heard that there was like one of the foremost 
uh, pig vet surgeons uh, at New Bolton. Um, and the spay that we got, it's called a lap spay because they're four years old. And it's very common that when female sow pigs get older, they can start to do cancer and tumors in their ovaries. So a laparoscopic spay means that you actually remove the full ovaries altogether. Um, so it has to be done very well and delicately. Um, but it is uh, wonderful because there's less incision points. They use a laparoscopic you know, scope and all this stuff. Um, so it is actually less invasive, but of course a little more costly. Um, and we really did want to make sure we trusted the right place. So yeah, we ended up stopping there first. Uh, of course, again, we were on and off a trailer again, right? You know, and finally back home here to Virginia. Yeah, and while we're at it, we should give a shout out to Woodstock. Yeah, 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 yeah. Woodstock Sanctuary has been fantastic. Actually, once you make friendships with other sanctuaries, it's essential, by the way, if anybody listening wants to start their own micro sanctuary, it's so essential because they've been there, they know, and they're willing to share, you know, information and kind of what works, what doesn't, uh, what their vets have recommended if you do have medical issues, just all of that, you need that support network. So yeah, Woodstock is great. Yeah, so then we're, we've brought them back to our sanctuary. <laughs> and again, it was now getting them uh, off the trailer. That was the challenge because right. now they felt kind of, you know, safe in the trailer. But eventually we, we got them off and they kind of were just very, very cautious, mm -hmm. very unsure. And we listened to all the advice from, from Woodstock uh, about creating a smaller space for them to feel safe. We had a, their barn ready and kind of a welcome home ceremony <laughs> plan. And, um, yeah. And then we started to develop that relationship very slowly. And um, how would you say, like, how long did that take? Yeah, I'd, I mean, you know, they're quite, animals are quite motivated by food, certainly. And I would also suggest that trust is built when you are consistent over and over and over again, right? With probably animals and humans, yes. Um, so we would always kind of come in, chat with them, give them the same kind of food system, you know, like everything, give them belly rubs, you know, whatever it is. That was their thing. Um, and we had to learn that about each one. Uh, so Rubia loves belly rubs. The dolly, the polka dotted one is so, so, and Grace doesn't really like to be touched that much, you know, so they have little grunts to let you know. And sometimes they walk away from you and you just have to respect that because you're learning about them, you know? Um, and actually on that note too, with the bunnies, um, not many people know because bunnies are so cute. They think that bunnies are cuddly, but actually bunnies don't like to be picked up. They're prey animals. So, so they are used to running and hiding because their sole existence in the food chain is to be food right out in the wild. And so they, they don't really like to be picked up. So that was a little bit of adjustment too. Now they jump on our lap and we'll pet them, but picking them up is, is a little bit much for them. They'll kick away. Uh, so now we've developed a way to work with them where we put their carrier, um, like a little kind of like a cat dog carrier idea. We put that into their enclosure, let them hop in and we'll take them like that, maybe out to their outdoor time space or what have you. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, giving you the understanding and spectrum that in our heads, like Ella was saying, it was all very romantic and we were full frolicking in the field with these animals. But when you get to really be, you know, handling and caring for an animal, you do have to learn a lot about them and then be consistent such that they trust you and respectful of what their breeds, right, want, you know, dictate or, or don't want. That's that's so interesting. Just just like just like humans, uh, animals have their own personality, their own quirks, their own mannerisms, their own preferences. You know, and mm -hmm. they're all individuals. And it's uh, it's neat that you can talk to uh, about each one of the animals in a very different way, and how which ones prefer different things. And, so um, for those that are, are making purchases and, and they um, want to understand, like, where does the money go? So can you talk a little bit about that, how that how their uh, donations are going to be supporting the lots of different ways uh, that the, the animals need support? Sure. Yeah. You want me to, you want to go? Uh, no, I'll let you go. I just yeah. will say before you, you get started that I was really ignorant, I have to mm. say, about the amount of cost involved in, especially since we were building it from the ground up. 
right? When there's already infrastructure, but just the just the fencing, and I'll let Ann talk about that, was just so much more than I, I anticipated. So that just at the beginning, a lot of our resources went there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know? absolutely. And, you know, mind you, other than building this from the ground up, we we're doing this through the pandemic, right? <laughs> and starting. So we were all passion over pandemic, right? <laughs> and um, and the reason I bring that up is because cost of wood and, and anything that would require a warehouse whatsoever, right, drove costs up. Uh, as maybe you have, as a, as a business owner, right, Jeff, have maybe uh, understood or witnessed or experienced. Um, so for us building, yeah, and the infrastructure of things, definitely. Um, for right now, we have, uh, you know, majority of things in place. Um, our pasture for these piggies are actually five acres. So we do eventually want to bring more in. However, as we have been talking about, they have their own, uh, you know, uh, personalities and such. So we want to make sure we bring in animals that could get along. But if they don't get along, then how do you care for them? You have to actually create a separate area. So fencing, barns, right? I mean, there's just so many projects that could occur from that by introducing new, new animals. Um, and then also the current piggies that we have actually have some medical needs also. Um, so they are, uh, even though they are big farm pigs, they are considered overweight. Uh, Grace, uh, the all black one, um, she is probably about the optimal weight. She's 630 pounds. So for their breed, they should probably be around 600. But uh, Dolly and uh, Rubia are 708 and 718 pounds. So um, it has caused a bit of what they call lameness uh, in the pigs. So meaning that they have some joint issues and they're kind of hobbling around or if not even limping. And that then sets into an arthritis for the girls. So we have them on some medication at the moment, but the medication can actually also have side effects. So we have to then have other plans in place for um say as they get older, eventually, uh, maybe an elderly care kind of building or something like that for them. So um, we're just bringing that up in that at the moment, they don't need that, there are other meds, but the infrastructure question will always come into play with the current animals and then when you introduce new animals as well. Um, and then also any, mo any money that's donated could go to feed, right? Other than their medical expenses, just because we have to keep feeding them what they need. Um, as, um, so with, um, with piggies, we supplement with um, kind of like a, it's like a oat corn mix, basically. Um, however, they have five acres of pasture, right? So they are constantly foraging and eating there. Um, and then with our bunnies, they eat hay all the time. And then we supplement with certain green veggies and maybe fruit every once in a while as well. Um, so let's see, I think medical expenses, right? Housing, um, infrastructure, food, yeah. anything yeah. else I'm missing on that Well, I, I would like to mention about our mission, you know, in, oh. as a whole is really about spreading awareness and helping people connect the food on their plate with the animal that it was. So Anne works very hard at our social media <laughs> and she's doing this full time uh, for no pay, completely volunteer. I'm of course volunteering as well, but Anne's full time doing that. So all the efforts, you know, everything that we're doing is supported by, by donations. Mm -hmm. And we want to really work on spreading that awareness and helping people connect. So these animals can be kind of like ambassadors, you know, for, for all of farm animals and really make a, a bigger impact than just, um, I don't want to say just, but, mm -hmm, you know, you know, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a really good point too, Ella, because what we'd like to do, um, probably, you know, as I mentioned, we um, started as a 501c3, but we've opened our barn doors this year. So in the next coming months into the first year uh, for us, we would like to start maybe micro grants as well for anyone who wants to start their own micro sanctuary. Um, and the reason we want to do that is because we're learning firsthand that startup costs are just can be enormous, even if you just want a website, right? Or if you want um, fencing or what, you know, whatever it is for, for your animals. So we would really like to be able to help in that way, maybe even help with spays or neuters or, you know, what, whatever it is. So financially, we would like to help those who want to get involved in the micro sanctuary movement. And also bringing other animals in, it all, it all depends on our, our finances because we do yeah. have the space, which is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but we have to be responsible knowing that we might have some very big costs coming up 
due to the the arthritis in the pigs. So we need to be responsible, knowing that we're we're responsible for these animals until until the day they pass. Yeah. <laughs> So I know that uh, uh, a big part of your social media outreach too, as well, uh, talking not only about the farm sanctuary, but why why not to eat animals, you know, and um, and talk about that relationship uh, becoming vegan and then uh, incorporating the the vegan message um, and consuming plant based um, and how it relates to the animals themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to start I, that one? Are you talking about our story of vegan, going vegan? Yes. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, I was I was seven when I stopped eating animals. It was, uh, well, I'll just say the story real quick for anybody who doesn't know. Uh, I came home from school one day. We learned about Daniel Boone in in class, and I was seven years old, and I said, man, this guy was so mean. He shot animals, and he ate them, and I just couldn't believe it, and I was very fortunate to have parents that, that were honest with me. And my mom said, well, you know, we're very lucky. Ella, we get to go to the grocery store and just buy our meat. We don't have to do that anymore. And for me, that's that was my light bulb moment. And I never ate animals again. And I kind of knew at that moment it was my purpose. I, I was horrified to know that that was an animal on my plate. Uh, so by the time I was 15, I had done all the research, um, which back back in those days, I was 1995, <laughs> when I turned 15, there was not much information out there. You had to go digging. Jeff, you know this very, very well. Um, so that that was the start of mine, and it just has never stopped. I, I knew that that was my purpose and my mission in life was really to bring veganism into the mainstream and, and do my part in whatever way that that however that looked. And this is just another way that I'm able to help fulfill that that mission and, and work on my purpose, which is why I'm so grateful to Anne for, for having started this and asked me to be on the board. Yeah, well, I, and for me, I did not link yet that, that that animal, right, was on my plate yet. I actually went the route where I started just losing the taste for me. Like it started to gross me out a little bit. And then I think when I started realizing like, oh, that's a vein in there or something, you know, like I was like, huh, huh. So I actually went vegetarian first and I was pescatarian for a little bit. I did that for about six years. And in that time I had become friends with Ella and Ella is so patient, by the way. She sat with me and I remember we would go over kind of like food and how you do it and how you get your nutrients and, you know, just like all that stuff. And then it was like, oh, because I rescued then my cat um, Santiago is the same. I actually saw him get hit by a car and um, he had all these issues with his colon, broken legs, like all this stuff. And I, I developed this really amazingly like deep relationship with my cat. So then I started kind of putting it all together where it was like, God, what would it be like to have an amazing relationship with a pig, right? Or say a chicken or a cow or whatever, all these animals that constantly get overlooked and that are used over and over and over again. In, in our opinion, right, exploited. So it really kind of progressed in that way, you know? Ella was definitely the catalyst and the fact that I fell in love with an animal and realized, whoa, what would that be like with other species as well? That's a, we, have a, <clears throat> we have a question that, that came in from Lori Kaufman. She said, can these animals be treated naturally um, or do they require um, pharmaceutical medications? And and you mm. want to talk to that. Uh, I know there are some conditions that really don't have too many um, natural options to them, but uh, is that something that you you look for and something that uh, you look at uh, alternative ways of, of helping the animals? Absolutely. So Ella and I love natural, organic, everything, right? So certainly when we look at our options, we we hope to do that. And, um, I'll give you a couple examples, right? What kind of real world, world examples? So um, when we brought the, the piggies, uh, we were really big um, issue here of having a lot of ticks. So um, not that there, I don't think that there have been known cases of say Lyme disease for pigs, but when they're all over them and they're sucking on it, you know, you've got to pull them off and all this stuff. But we went the natural route of, of like a spray that had different oils and things on it. The piggies went crazy. They were rolling around trying to take it off of them. They couldn't stand it, right? So then we ended up going with a bit more of a medication kind of spray and it didn't have a smell and it kind of kept off, you know, some of them, whatever to with them. 
So that was one where we tried it. They didn't like it. And so we tried to course correct and figure out a different you know, option. Um, with the lameness, right? We've been told, well, hey, what about acupuncture, right? For, for your pigs. And I've heard mixed reviews on that. We certainly could try it, but I've definitely heard that for, because you have to keep in mind too, with the animal, you weigh out, like now you restrain the pig in such a way that it doesn't hurt anyone, the vet or the person who's administering the acupuncture needles to the animal. Does that cause the pig more stress to do that, to do it just because you have to do it, say, you know, homeopathic or natural? And does it then actually become effective for what you're doing, which is this arthritis, right? You know, so you you really have to weigh the pros and cons of a that animal, how they'll respond, and whether or not there's a there's an actual result or a payoff from that decision, right? You know, so um, uh, because our animals had never had things like that ever ever done. And um, they they definitely um, they've gotten uh, their vaccines, but they had to be um, put into kind of like a holding spot so they wouldn't kick or, you know, and they're 700 pounds. So you have to imagine that either stepping on you, pushing you over. I mean, it's it's a hazard that way, too. Right. So we're just bringing these kinds of things up in, in that it's it's more it's more than just, hey, we'd like to do it because we want to say we're doing it organically or, or in a homeopathic way. You have so many more variables to consider, really. Um, now, with the bunnies, maybe there would be a little bit more. Um, and actually, our bunny vet is fantastic. She actually does do acupuncture and different things as well um, on animals. So in those cases, if if the bunny respond, you know, to it better or something like that, we could go that route. Um, so we do really try to consider all all options. Yeah, and it's never easy to make these decisions. Right. And of course, the animal's best interests are always in our in our hearts. There's also though the allocation of resources that we're you know we're constantly being asked to bring in more animals, and it's so hard to say no. But we know we need to be responsible. But we also say, okay, well, where are we allocating our resources? We've got right now the medication Rubia is on is like fourteen dollars, <laughs> right? And if we chose the uh, acupuncture route, right. that could be hundreds you know in dollars, hundreds right. up to thousands right. of dollars. And how many could we bring in on a whole other animal for that? So. Right. There's no easy right or wrong. Of course, we want to. We'd love to do everything naturally, holistically. We just have to kind of take it case by case. Mm -hmm. Ruby wants belly rubs. By oh, way. Yeah, you wanna you wanna show. <laughs> so this pig demands belly rubs, as you can see. Um, so she literally comes and lays down right at um, our feet, and she's all muddy. Yes. And uh, it doesn't matter. She loves it anyway. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> you want to say hi, sweetheart? <laughs> She's so muddy. <laughs> it's like finger painting. It is. Yeah. It is. We do this all every day for a long time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but so that's such a great question, by the way. So thank you for asking that. It was yeah. Lori. Yeah, Laurie. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that question. And so <clears throat> what's what's next for you? Where where do you see yourself going? What's the future um, for for um, for not only you, but for what you're doing as far as education goes, what you're doing as far as working with um, maybe other sanctuaries and uh, other people or other groups? Sure. Uh, yeah, so we are very dedicated to kind of vegetating, right? Um, and so one of the things that Hogs and Kisses has done is a side project where we've created an educational video series on our YouTube channel. It's called Beat Around the Barn and Beat as in B-E-T, right? And um, we're just picking all different kinds of vegan topics. Uh, or anyone who might be veg curious or all the way to say animal activism, anywhere on that spe spectrum um, of topics so that we can help educate people on it where it might be uh, triggering conversations or questions, but we try to model it in a healthy way so that we're all learning. Um, I think that a lot of times in the vegan world, there's a lot of um, I know the right way or uh, a little bit of righteousness. And so we're really dedicated into that's awesome. We want to hear your point of view. How about the other point of views, too, as well? Uh, so we do that through Beat Around the Barn. 
We've released um, six episodes. We're about to release a seventh actually next week. And that's called, So You Want to Start a Sanctuary? <laughs> um, and we've interviewed some amazing people for that one as well. So absolutely check that out. Um, we'll continue to do them um, on various topics. And um, <clears throat> so that's our education efforts. And then on top of that, we mentioned that we would love to help uh, in the next year or so, anyone who wants to get started with their own um, micro sanctuary, whether it is through a small micro grant or helping with space or so financial assistance, but then also to helping to connect those individuals with all the right folks in the sanctuary world. We have been really meeting some amazing people with great resources. Um, speaking of a great resource, there's one that's called the Open Sanctuary Project. So that's opensanctuary.org. Anything and everything that you can think of uh, regarding starting a sanctuary, maintaining sanctuary, animals have all been created on a free open source. And it's lovely, lovely, lovely. So um, anyway, just wanted to throw that out as well. I think those are our two big ones, right? Is there another one, Ella, that we're missing or no? Um, no, those are the two big mm -hmm. ones in terms of education, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I do want to mention, I know you mentioned donations before as well, but we're also always looking for volunteers to do different things. Um, and this has been a tough time, it sounds like, for sanctuaries to have volunteers. And you don't have to necessarily be here in locally. Uh, we've got lots of opportunities. So if this is something you want to kind of get your feet wet and learn more and, and uh, help us out and you don't maybe have the resources, then that would be phenomenal too. So getting in touch with us for that would be great. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And, and volunteering is a great experience for people to get the, the first-hand connection, both with the animals and what the, the whole experience of uh, a farm sanctuary is about. Because it's a lot of work, I can imagine, and um, a lot of challenges and a lot of things that, like you explained, you weren't even aware of, you weren't expecting. And it was a kind of learn as you go. So having those resources available and helping direct people to those resources can be very valuable to that. We got another question from Raymond Deckert. <clears throat> he says, there are so many animals being slaughtered for human food. Do you think your efforts will have much of an impact on this situation? And I, I see what you're doing is twofold, which is um, not only supporting the animals that would have been uh, led to slaughter and allowing them to, to have a life. And every individual life is important. It's not about quantity. If it happens to be your life, is it important? Yes, you would say. And, and so is their life. Every life is important. Every life is worth saving. Is it possible to save the trillions of animals that are killed? No, it's not. But through education and through other support, we can help move people off of animal-based diets to plant-based diets and therefore reduce the number that are going to slaughter at the same time when the opportunity arises to allow these particular individual animals to be able to live out a natural life, a happy life and not be a life of suffering, an extremely short life of suffering. Most of these animals are slaughtered in, in their, before they even reach their equivalent of teenage years. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them are only a matter of months old before they're led to slaughter when they live you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, so really uh, it's about reducing the amount of suffering when you can. But also, like you do, it's twofold, doing the education to help move people off of a, uh, onto a plant-based diet so um, there is less need for these animals uh, while supporting those that you can as, as individuals too. And I'll let you talk about that because, but I'm, I'm very passionate. That's why I love what you're doing. It's not, it's not a one or the other equation. It's, it's all of it, you know. Yeah, no, and I can totally relate to the thought process mm -hmm. um, of uh, that person. I, I forgot the name, but uh, because I was I was in that same place um, for for most of my vegan years of saying, you know, I don't quite get it with the sanctuaries. Yes, of course, I want every animal saved, and I'm so happy for those animals. But I'm like, that's a drop in the bucket. We've got trillions of animals suffering, mm -hmm. so I didn't especially now though with the social media age that we it's so much easier to 
get the word out to show the animals to the masses and help massive amount of people start to make that connection um, and to show people that every life is worth it. So there's just so many aspects to having a sanctuary that's much bigger than the few animals that we have here, each that are worthy of living out their lives in luxury, if, if we have it our way, um, but also then to utilize that as a, an educational tool to make a bigger impact. And I know with me, I, I'm doing this um, as a volunteer thing, and then I've got my other brand that I really focus on bringing veganism into the mainstream in other ways. So you can do it all, is what I'm saying, <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah, I would absolutely, so, um, I'll just say that, you know, how many people asked uh, me separately, like, oh, why are you taking the piggies to the new Bolton Center? Right. You know, oh, really? You're doing all of that for your pigs? Right. Like it was literally like that. So just that planting of that seed in that person's head that, oh, wow, huh, you know, they start to wonder and then they come now and visit and they come and meet the animals. Right. Or as Ella had said, they become these ambassadors, meaning that we provided, this is kind of, I think where Micro Sanctuary Resource Center goes with it, is providing the animals a platform so that their voice is heard, right? So, because a lot of times we say that animals don't have voices and we understand they don't speak like us in, in that kind of way. But if you, if we help them tell their own story or we help show how amazing they are, that translates, it plants a seed somewhere. So all of that is for kind of education efforts so people definitely think twice about what's on their plate. Now, impacting billions of numbers overall, no, that right, saving three doesn't necessarily help, right, the, the billion. It's more about helping people to rethink it and rethink food and rethink their connection with animals and nature. Um, so I think that's really where our, our efforts lie with Yes, of course, providing best care for the current animals we have, but doing it in a way that that's kind of like a bigger activism in a way, allowing for these animals to be able to speak through us and through these platforms uh, out to everyone. Yeah, and, and thank goodness for the answers on social media, where um, you know we can have all of our uh, listeners and viewers watching and seeing the piggy right behind you, you know, driving and. <laughs> And feel that connection, you know, yeah. that, that 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 being deserves love. And I think that's such the problem with modern society is that we do go to a grocery store and see a plastic package with what we call something else, beef or mm -hmm. poultry or, you know, we don't mm -hmm. even call it the animal. We are mm -hmm. so disconnected from the process and from the being, the living playful, happy, you know, wanting belly rubs, wanting to lay in the yes. sunshine, wanting to roll around in the mud. That yeah. joy that they have naturally is inherent in all of the animals, but we're so disconnected from that. Mm -hmm. It's now turned into just a piece of packaging in, in a store. And right. by showing this kind of video, and thank you for, for doing this live from the, hey, there's another one. There's another one. <laughs> this is, yeah, this uh, one is thank Dolly. Thank you for doing this live right from the farm because it is such sure. a cool experience to see <laughs> those amazing beings and, yeah. and what you're doing for them. And um, <laughs> so that's a powerful statement. And thank God for social media and videos like this that can allow people to get reconnected. When I had my big breakthrough in 1985, like a long wow. time ago, wow. um, I remember that moment where someone helped me through my very, very intense, painful experience of suffering with suicidal depression. Mm. And that breakthrough released me from so much pain I just sat in meditation all night long asking, oh my God, how do I give this, pay this forward? How do I help people release themselves from pain? And in that medication, in that medication, yeah, is what it was. It was a meditation, but it was a medication to do as well. And in that connection, reconnection to my own heart, my own sense of love, my own connection to myself, I asked, how do I do this? And in my meditation, my higher voice just said, stop causing suffering to, to mm -hmm. other beings. 
And I, I just like, wow, why did I never get this before? And, and it was such a powerful thing because it didn't require anybody else's participation. Just me. I was the only one that needed to change and stop contributing to the suffering of animals by eating. And it was just such a light bulb moment. I, you know, I, my breakthrough was transcendent. It, I connected to, to that love through my, through my own, connecting to my own suffering. I connected to the suffering of others and that empathy just exploded in that moment in reconnecting to my own pain. I reconnected to my own love as well that was behind all that pain. And for me, veganism was just, that's it. And also it was the moment where I dedicated the rest of my life, like Ella was talking about, to helping others find that connection in themselves. Mm. And that's why I've chosen, you know, my particular path, because I'm fascinated by how this amazing body works and how health and fitness can bring people joy. I know that having a health, a, a level of health and fitness can alleviate a lot of mood problems, a lot of depression. And so that's been an amazing gift. It's a gift where you can help animals, you can help the environment, you can help your own self emotionally, you can help your physical self so that you're not suffering with physical pain in, in uh, disease states. I mean, there's so much love in that decision making. So I, I'm loving that you guys are really showing that connection directly with the animals, um, especially the food animals, the animals that we consider food most people can make the connection with pets, right? With a cat or a dog that lives with them in the house because they're right there with them. They're feeling their emotions, their connections, their moods, their behaviors. But we don't have that connection with the farm animals, the animals that we normally consider for food. So bringing that, those pigs, those bunnies that were meant for tables um, mm -hmm. and, and reconnecting people to that animal in a different way. I think that's such a powerful message that goes to the bigger um, cause of, of helping people. Because once you make that choice out of a compassion, out of a reconnection to the animal, we can also begin to make that choice of how that animal, eating that animal has negatively impacted our mood, our health, uh, you know, our behavior. And, Making that change can be such a bountiful, positive experience that really encourages other people then to say, okay, well, how can I give back? And this is a great opportunity. And why, you know, why now that we're having some success with Clean Machine, that we do this every quarter, you know, every protein that's sold, it feeds a hungry child throughout the world. Um, every purchase made on our inter, uh, internet through at 3% gets donated to elephant aid to help preserve the uh, wonderful elephants in Africa. And every quarter we give back to a nonprofit like you too as well. So it's, it's, it's really a wonderful opportunity to find successes within this business. But also that that people get that opportunity to participate, to participate with you in Hogs and Kisses Farm through through purchasing something that's helping them with their health and fitness too. And, and you know, just to be a part of it. I think that's a wonderful experience. And, and thank you for so much of, of all of what you're doing. Um, how do people can connect with you on social media, on your website, and, and how can they go about making donations or volunteering and, and what that connection is? Sure, absolutely. So hogsandkisses.org, uh, that is our website. And then you can find us on Facebook and Instagram, which is slash hogs kisses. So fa Facebook slash hogs kisses, Insta slash hogs kisses. Um, and then also too uh, on YouTube, and we're on LinkedIn as well. We've been posting kind of just like studies and such there. Um, and um, if you go to our website, there are actually multiple ways. If you want to make, of course, a direct donation, fantastic. If not, we are a part of um, the Amazon Smile 
um, um, give back uh, as well. So you can have us as your charity. We have a wish list as well on Amazon for items because sometimes people maybe as they donate would rather know that they're donating a bag of feed and that that is coming to us. So great. We have that as well. And we also have some merchandise here. We had a contest winner this year that is actually our board member's cousin uh, who drew this. Um, his name is James, a cousin's name who drew this was Danielle. And um, anyway, that is on hogsandkisses.threadless.com. So we have this and our logo and t-shirts and mugs and all kinds of stuff. All of that also comes back to us as well. Um, so you can connect with us and donate. And then as Ella had mentioned, we absolutely looking for volunteers too. Um, so you can also drop us a line that way uh, via our website if you're interested in that. Um, talk about uh, real quick uh, before we go. Um, your farm is where, and can people schedule visits and, and tours and 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 uh, come out and do videos and stuff like that? Absolutely, yeah, great. So we are located just south of Charlottesville, Virginia, in an area called North Garden. And uh, absolutely, we are allowing people to come and do a meet and greet with the animals. Uh, we will eventually be having events where it might be a little more education focused. Uh, also to eventually we'll likely be partnering up with maybe some local schools if the kindergartners wanna come over and have like a little bit of a lesson plan about animals and what's on their plate and such. Uh, so that's in the works too. Um, but all they have to do is just email. Um, and if you'd like to email me directly, that's a Molina. So a M O L I N A at hogsandkisses.org. You're welcome to say, Hey, can I come visit or what have you? You're welcome to come and do a meet and greet with the, with the animals. Oh, wonderful. Uh, any any uh, parting uh, ideas or, or stories? I love hearing yeah, all the yes. stories on the animals <laughs> individually because it's get, it's great to get to know them personally kind of in their own ways. But Sure. I actually have a little, little something I would love to part with because you're calling this a, a give back. I just wanted to mention, Ellen and I were chatting about this the other day because I was listening to a Buddhist monk talk about their morning routine because you know you were talking about mental wellness as well uh, you know a spiritual emotional wellness anyway they were talking about morning routines and the way they do uh their own training uh, what time they wake up when they meditate how they always make their bed area all this kind of thing one of the first things he mentioned that they do in the morning is giving and that that is also a part of their morning routine is because it's for their soul as well right but not just for them that giving is also the opportunity for the other. So one thing that Ella and I were saying is that we love our morning routine with the animals because it's a giving. Uh, so I just wanted to leave that with, with everybody that if you're wondering about all of this, by all means, if it isn't giving through purchasing and it's giving more towards a volunteering or going and um, maybe even doing a little bit of education of your own towards veganism, whatever it is, giving a part of yourself and your self-expression out in the world absolutely will make a difference for animals, for yourself, but also for the animals. So I do wanted, I just wanted to share that, that um, we love what you're doing, Jeff, really, we truly do. And uh, I really appreciate the, the give back and uh, that you're supporting us in this way. Oh, thank you. Blessings to you both. Uh, incredible work. Thank you for all you're doing. It was wonderful to talk to you. I'd love to have you back on towards the end of the month uh, to talk about a little bit of a wrap up, maybe, if that's possible. Um, love to. But um love 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 the work that you're doing and in the connection and the broader work that you're doing directly with the animals but also directly with the human animals and all your education and outreach too i think that's so important um so for all of you out there remember that every single purchase through our website 10 percent of your purchase will go directly to them to help support these animals help support their growth their educational efforts and all that they're doing this is the way we give back. And for me, a give back, why it's not just a donation, it's a give back because I feel given to. This is a wonderful world we live in where we get lots of opportunities to share love with each other. And there are lots of ways to share love through education, through direct experience, like working on a sanctuary, um, just helping other people connect to themselves to be live a healthier, happier life. 
uh, whether it's fitness, like Ella is amazing at, uh, that's why she's one of our ambassadors. Thank you for that too as well. Um, but in every aspect of living the joys of life, that's what we're gonna do. And that's why I call it a give back because I feel so given to in this life. And thank you for all you're doing. Wonderful uh, to have you on. And uh, yeah, let's let's circle back around. I'd love to chat one more time. Uh, I love hearing the stories about the animals too. Well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk again next week. Uh, we'll have um, uh, one of our athletes, uh, Brendan. Um, Bicycle Brendan is doing another one of his major adventures. He has the world record for um, transit from the northern part of the United States to Key West. So he holds the Guinness World Book of Records. And speaking of books, he's got his own book out. We'll be talking about that book too in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for lots more stuff. There's lots of good things happening. And thank you all. And thank you for joining us.